good to see you this morning. As always, if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And the scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 6, verse 14. And it reads there, in Romans 6, verse 14, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And uh, one, one of the best things that I have ever read from a world leader came, uh, well, I'll just read it and then I'll, I'll tell you. It says the following, you say the price of my love is not a price that you're willing to pay. You cry in your tea which you hurl by the sea when you see me go by. Why so sad? Remember we had an arrangement when you went away. Now you're making me mad. Remember despite our estrangement, I'm your man. You'll be back soon, you'll see. Remember that you belong to me. You'll be back and time will tell that you'll remember that I served you well. Oceans rise, empires fall. We have seen each other through it all. And when push comes to shove, I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love. You say our love is draining, that you can't go on, but you'll be the one complaining when I am gone. King George III from the Broadway musical Hamilton. That's a play. That's what it's sung in the play. And what this shows, even as in a Broadway play, what this shows is that we as Americans, we as people, we have a history of desiring to be independent. And in the Broadway musical Hamilton, what happens in that musical is that it tracks not only the life of Alexander Hamilton, but also the situations and circumstances that surrounded American independence. And even since that time, even today, there is an overwhelming sense, particular to our culture, particular to our culture and our country, that we have a desire to be independent. We have a desire to be free. And with that comes some very positive things. But also with that comes some very negative things things as we see here in Romans chapter 6 because in Romans chapter 6 there were people that had a desire and also wanted to be free and they wanted to be so free that they didn't want to really live the way that God had described them to live and so what often happens in and we see this even in our own lives. There comes a time in a kid's life where they turn the magic number 16 or the magic number 18 and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it seems, there's an appeal to freedom. There's an appeal to doing what I want to do. I mean, think about it. Remember when the kid, when your kid or grandkid, when they were 13 and they were 12, when they were 10, and you asked them to do something, and more likely than not, they just did it without asking. But all of a sudden, when they turned 16, like, you can't ask me to do that. I'm 16. I remember the first time when I got, when I had the opportunity to go out and drive a car on my own without permission, independent of my mom and of my dad. And I did something wrong and I can remember the first thing that my parents would hold against me is, if you continue to do that, you're not going to be able to drive the car. Well, that's my car. I'm 16. I'm independent now. For those in the audience that are 18 and below, that's always a bad move. That is never the right way to handle the situation. Because here's what happened. My father, who I love dearly, he just had a knack for being really, really blunt. And so did my mom. She's from New York. So I, I was, I was uh, in a bad, I was in a pickle either way, right? My father would look at me and said, oh, you're independent, huh? Y'all know where this is going, right? And it, uh, I'm just telling, it's, it never goes well. Uh, okay, 
So if you're independent, let me ask you a question. Um, how much of the mortgage do you pay here? Yeah, that'd be goose egg. That'd be zero, right? And then he asked me, okay, well, uh, who pays, do you pay, what percentage of the electricity bill do you pay here? And by the way, um, how much money did you put towards the car that you drive? Yeah, I'm not as independent as I like to think that I am. And my, and my father would, would kindly, in his own way, say, as long as you live under my roof, you abide by my rules. Whether you think that you're totally and completely independent or not. See, thinking you're independent when you're actually not independent is trouble. And there are people in Romans chapter 6 who are battling this idea or battling this, this uh, or having this struggle between wanting complete and total 100% autonomy but then also recognizing that, hey, they're not the people that they think that they are. They struggle with sins of the flesh. And so what they construct, and this is what we do too, and what they construct is they want to keep their ability to have a, 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 vi a viable relationship with God uh, in complete and total standing, but also they want what they want. And so what do they use to do that? Paul answers that in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. The idea would be, if we can just make grace the catch-all for everything that we do and everything that we say and how we act, then we can actually be 100% independent but still be in the good graces of God. And Paul says there in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, we shall, what shall we say then? We can continue to live in sin that grace may abound by no means. See, here's the thing. You can think that you're 100% autonomous from everyone, anyone, and anything. But you're not. Nobody is 100% free. Nobody. Because whether we understand it or whether we like it or not, what we're going to see in Romans 6 this morning is that you are a slave. You are. Spiritually speaking, everyone here is a slave to something or a slave to someone. And there are only two options that Paul is going to lay out for your life and for my life. And as we look and as we uh, you know, each time that we uh, have either midterm elections or we have presidential elections, we're reminded of the freedoms that we have in America. That's all good and that's all well. But I want to want you to understand this morning, the most important thing that you need to concentrate on in your life is holiness. And in pursuing holiness, we have to recognize that we're a slave to something or someone. And there are only two options that Paul lays out. And so what does that mean? Before we get into that, what that means is that this morning, you cannot remain and you are not spiritually neutral. When it comes to being holy, when it comes to a relationship with God or not having a relationship with God, there is no spiritual Switzerland. You either are there's no middle ground there. There is no fence to sit on. And so this is what Paul's going to lay out, and this is the message for this morning. There are only two options. You're either a slave to sin, or you're a slave to the Savior. You're either a slave to sin, or you're either a slave to to the Savior. But that raises questions, okay? Well, how do I know which side I'm on? And how do I navigate through all of that?
And so these people here, they're saying, well, we've got grace, and grace covers, and grace is a doctrine that we need to talk more about. But from the, the beginning, what Paul is saying is that you and I cannot just live however we want and think that we're going to be right with God on the basis of His grace. By doing that, we've actually perverted the doctrine of grace. Because in perverting the doctrine of grace to say I can live how I want, with who I want, whenever I want, we've actually affirmed that we are slaves to sin. And so notice what Paul talks about. Notice some of the key words that are here in Romans chapter 6. We see that sin is a key word. We see that grace is a key word. We see that life or live is a key word. And we see that die or death is a key word. And so what Paul brings before them by way of reminder from verse uh, ch from chapter 6, verse 1 through 5, is he reminds them, once again, of what they've gone through. He's not talking to non-believers here. He's talking to believers here. And he says, don't you understand or don't you remember exactly what you've done and who you are? He, they, he says there, there's no way. How can we who died to sin? See, these are people who have said, I am going to be a slave to Jesus Christ. I'm going to be, uh, you know, a servant of Jesus Christ. That in doing that, I'm going to bury this old person of sin. The person that I used to be is no longer there. And this new person, this new creation called Christian is who I want to be. And Paul says, remember that. Remember exactly the what it felt like when you rose from the watery grave of baptism so that you might be buried with him through that baptism into what? Death, spiritual death. At baptism, sin dies. And here's the question. This is the irony that Paul is trying to draw out. How could that which is dead live? How could that which is dead live? And we understand that. Several months ago, um, my mother-in-law bought two goldfish for her grandkids. So they came over and see the goldfish go, goldfish! Goldfish! Well, my uh, father-in-law named them Simon and Garfunkel. It's just my father-in-law. Well, let's just say Garfunkel didn't make it too long. Now, how would my father-in-law and mother-in-law be able to distinguish between the death of one fish and the continuous living of another? Because the fish that has died looks completely and totally different than the one who lives. And it isn't a blurred line. It's not like it's half alive, half dead, that when the fish died, it was completely dead and no longer retained the properties of a living fish. It took a while for me to craft that, by the way. Think about it in terms of people. That people who have died no longer retain the same properties and the same functions as people who live. And the same thing is true for the spiritually dead and the spiritually alive. That the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit are completely different from one another. That one should function and look and be observed by the outside world as being completely different than the one who's dead. And Paul is saying, how can you say that you're alive through the spirit of Jesus Christ, but then act as though you're dead? They do not mix. They are oil and water. They are holiness and unholiness. There's the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. And what Paul is saying to these people is that you are either a slave to sin or a slave to the Savior, and you can't claim to be a slave to the Savior and live like sin. You can't proclaim to be a child of heaven and then your life look like hell can't do that. And he's saying, why would you 
go back to that after experiencing the newness of life that's found in Jesus Christ. So that as we die, and just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we might too walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified as he sets this table. He's saying that the old person of sin not only died, but was crucified. It was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. positive choice. The Bible teaches that man has been given free will because love, true love demands choice to either freely reject or freely accept the relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says in verse 12. On the basis of the newness of life, on the basis that Christ died once for all, on the basis that you are now walking in the newness of life if you've been baptized for the remission of your sins, therefore let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. See, if you're a, a servant or a slave of the Savior, sin has no place. Sin has no hold. Sin has no voice in the life of the Christian. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that you'll never sin, but there's a difference between sinning one time or occasionally over allowing it to reign and dominate and rule in your life. decision that was made on the basis of his rule and reign and dominion dictated the direction and dictated the lives of people here. The same thing is true when he talks about sin reigning in your and my mortal body is that sin once it takes hold and once it takes root and once it has dominion and once it reigns dictates every aspect of life of the person who allows it to rule and reign. And that's primarily on the basis of the carnal desires of the flesh. Things like pride. Things like jealousy. Things like envy. Things like sexual immorality. And when those, when decisions and life choices are made on the basis of those things, you can be assured to know that those are the things that rule and reign your life and those are the things that identify and help us understand that we are not slaves to the Savior, we're not servants of the Savior, we're servants of sin. aspect of that is that if you make moral choices on the basis of your pocketbook rather than what God says or if you bend the numbers a little bit at work or if you're immoral at work because it's pragmatic or because hey you know the boss might give you a little bit of a bump if you do this illegal thing over here guess what that's sin that rules and reigns, you are not a servant of the Savior. 
Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as an instrument for unrighteousness. Now two words here that are very interesting is the word present and the word instrument. The word present can literally mean dedicate. Do not dedicate your body, your person, your life to missing the mark, which is what sin is, to missing the mark as an instrument for unrighteousness. Now the word instrument there is a scalpel or a cutting tool. It's a medical terminology. So what Paul is literally saying here is do not dedicate yourself as a cutting tool for unrighteousness. What does that mean? That means that as sin rules in your life and as sin reigns in your life, Satan will use you to cut out the righteousness seen in the world. What does that mean? That means that Satan will use your influence to cut God out of people's life. If you dedicate yourself to presenting your body that way. Now, I don't know about you, but when I pass from this earth, I don't want people to look at me and say, that guy right there, nothing but trouble. Every person, every relationship, every circumstance, every situation he found himself in, he wreaked havoc and chaos and he destroyed people's lives. I don't think people wake up in the morning wanting to live that way. But let's make no mistake about it. The passions and desires of the flesh are strong. And the only thing that can counterbalance and destroy those passions and desires in your life is if you're being molded and shaped in a relationship with Jesus Christ on a daily basis. And it doesn't matter who you vote for. It doesn't matter what car you drive. It doesn't matter houses or how small your house is. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much clout you have in the community. It doesn't matter who your dad was, who your mom was. It doesn't matter what your profession is. Sin cares not about any of those things. Because the number one thing that Satan wants to do in your life is make you people in the workplace, as you engage people at school, 
you are not only a beacon, but you are actively involved in helping people see what the righteousness of Jesus Christ looks like so that you might be able or that they might be able to remove or cut away unrighteousness through seeing Jesus through you. That's what Paul says. Be dedicated to that. And I'm going to be hard here for a second. Being dedicated to that does not simply mean checking the to-do list on Sunday morning. It doesn't mean that. If you are dedicated to something, you are consumed by that thing which you are dedicated to. You cannot be dedicated to your husband or to your spouse if you only talk to him once a week. It's impossible. You can't be dedicated to your job if you just show up once a month. What would happen? You're fired. But, I mean, let's, let's say for a, a split second Let's say for a split second, as a Marine who served in Iraq, I'm, I'm in the battlefield, and I have proclaimed that I am dedicated to the people in my platoon, but in the moment that they need me, I say, I'm sitting this one out. That's not being dedicated. And we live in a culture that wants us to draw our dedication to anything and everything as long as it doesn't involve holiness and righteousness and the proclamation of the gospel. We live in that culture. And if you do not believe that, just go ahead and check out a couple commercials. And if we're going to impact the culture, and if we're going to mold ourselves after what Jesus Christ wants us to be, there has to be a consistent, concerted effort to be dedicated both in the family individually, but also in the people of God collectively. And this isn't going to be popular. But in this country, we care way more, way more about things like politics and sports than we often do in presenting ourselves as holy and righteous before the Father. I would love to know how many people in the country who proclaim Christ go and participate in sporting events that go on into the night at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And they will dedicate themselves because after all, that's their team. After all, that's their activity. After all, those are my friends. After all, that's my family. of righteousness so that when we impact a culture that is by and large unrighteous people who live in the dark might see the light because whether you know it or not whether you accept it or not whether you're comfortable with it or not the people in the culture who live after the culture who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ are going to hell and that's family members, and that's friends, and that's strangers, and that's people who are rich, that's people who are poor, that's people who don't go to church. Those are people who don't know about God. And I can't stand by, and you can't stand by, and dedicate ourselves to the things of the world, to the neglect of being a righteous vessel for Jesus Christ. Can't do that. And what that indicates about you and what that indicates about me, that if that's my life, that means that I'm a slave. That I'm a slave and a servant to sin. To know to do the right thing and not to do it to him who does it, it is sin. Brothers and sisters.
for sin shall have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. This doesn't mean that the Christian doesn't have any obligations when it comes to commands. What Paul is simply saying here is that under the law system, it's, it's hard to not be dominated by sin because under the law-keeping system, you're constantly imperfect. And he says with Christ, that whole mentality is done away with, but there's grace there. And I want to plead with us this morning. And I want to plead with myself this morning. And if we're going to claim, and we claim to be Christians, not that these other things aren't okay to participate in. I hope you go and vote this week. I hope you root your heart out for the Panthers. I hope you root your heart out for Duke, not North Carolina. I, <laughs> I hope you root for Carolina if that's your team. But brothers and sisters, we cannot be so obsessed with these things that when people look at our lives, it seems like we care more about those things than the things of God. That's all I'm saying. And that we've got to be real with ourselves about the places and the areas where we struggle individually and collectively. We live, as I hear all the time on the TV, we live in tumultuous times. And that might be true. But brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, we live in a great time as well. A time in which, because there is such a severe contrast between the church and the culture, that the church has a great opportunity to connect, to engage, to talk to people who need Jesus Christ. And you don't have to go on a horse in carriage to do it. You can simply do it at the tips of your fingers. But we can't do that. And we can't be effective in that. If we're dedicating ourselves, if we're presenting ourselves to a different master. This morning, I want to ask us all, myself included, Let's think about it.